is God opposed to the civil government teaching children? Yes, categorically, emphatically, yes. God does not want the civil government to be teaching children. It's not merely a matter of the content. It's not merely a matter of what they are teaching the children, but it is the fact that they are teaching the children that has um, become dysfunctional. And so these parents need to take the responsibility that God has given them directly. And uh, they have an obligation and responsibility before God uh, to teach their own children uh, God's principles and his patterns and his ways. Okay, so I have a lot of friends in uh, um, in the in the in the local uh, public school here who are Christians. They love Jesus. I know them personally. Um, you know, they are in that system as missionaries, and therefore, I feel my children. Uh, safe there uh, to to receive a good education. Our community is pretty conservative. Uh, we've been able to fend off all the work material that tries to sneak in. Um, what's what's why would God be against me putting my kids in there? Well, I hear this all the time, and it's that old saying, that adage that our school is different. Yeah. Right. We know that things are bad. Things are happening out there somewhere, but it's not happening at our school. Our teachers are Christian. Our principals are Christian. Our coaches are Christian. So the the false assumption is that uh, the schools are safe for our children, and for the most part, they are not. Um, they have standardized curriculum. They have standardized requirements about what they're supposed to teach. Increasingly, they have DEI standards. Uh, diverse, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, that teach these uh, viewpoints uh, that are opposed to biblical Christianity. But I think that the presence of the Christian teachers in the school system gives these Christian parents a false sense of security, that, that those Christian teachers will keep their child safe from the harmful peer pressure, from the indoctrination, from all of the uh, sexual pressure, all the things that they're facing in the schools. This happened many years ago, but there was a friend of mine and I uh, who went to Missouri because he was a professor at a university in Missouri. And so what we did is we went to small towns in his area where he lived, little communities of 2,000 people or less where they have a little public school. And he would go into the local public school and he would ask to see their literature books for teens, you know, like yeah. junior high. And he would ask to see the sex education curriculum and uh, a few other things, sometimes the health curriculum, uh, just, just a few things that were like required reading for, particularly like literature, required reading for junior high in particular. And he knew certain books to look for. So he would look and see if those books were in the, the school library, if they were part of the mandatory reading lists and so forth. And then he would go uh, have a seminar at a church um, later that week and put photos on the screen uh, that he took of just photos of the textbooks or of the literature books. And then he would read aloud and say, this is what is in your seventh grade literature uh, required reading course at the public school in this town. So every mm -hmm. seventh grader in this town has to read this book. Let me read to you what it says. And usually it was very uh, sexually explicit, very inappropriate, very you know, anti-biblical in its worldview. Um, and then the sex education curriculum, he would say, this is what they're teaching. Uh, they're normalizing homosexuality. They are uh, promoting children, uh, or sorry, promoting teenagers, you know, having sex before they're married and so on and so forth. And what was difficult was he's just showing photos of what's in the textbooks in their local public school in these small towns in Missouri, Central America, or Central United States, I mean. Yeah. And these public school teachers who work at that school and attend th these churches would get on the phone and call the pastor 
And the pastor was not usually ever attending these seminars, but he would show up and he would say, what's going on? I just got a call that there's a problem. And we say, okay, so what did they say the problem was? He would say, they said that you are promoting pornography here in the, at the church. And we would say, well, all we're doing is we are reading excerpts from the required literature books for the seventh graders at the public school here in your town. And we're just showing what is in the sex education curriculum that they teach here in this public school. Yeah. And he would ask the teachers in the classroom, are they teaching this at the local public school? And the teachers would say, no, absolutely not. We do not have those books. We do not teach those things. Those are not in the library. They're not being taught. We, we are not teaching any of those things. And he would look at us and say, well, where did you get those things? And my friend was the professor. He would say, I went in there on Tuesday, two days ago. I took these photos. I was in the library. I asked them to give me the, the books. Um, I promise you, these books are in the, the school and they are being taught. And some of them are mandatory to be taught to the students at the public school. And he would ask the teachers, is that true? And they would say, no, these people are lying. Those books are not in our public school. We are not teaching those. Or, you know, maybe one of those books is in the library, but it's not required reading. And, you know, nobody even knows it's there. And, and, they, and they were lying. And he would look at us and he would look at them. And you could tell he's going to believe the people in his church. And so he would say, you guys need to pack up and leave. And we yeah. would get thrown out of churches trying to inform parents and inform the con and grandparents about the things that their students were actually learning. So I, I think it's very much what C.S. Lewis said, where he said, if parents of every generation knew what was actually being taught in their local public school, the history of education would be quite different. Yeah. Um, well, another uh, predicament is is um, the the school, the education is neutral. Um, the, the, the school is under strict government law that says there's not going to be any mixing of religion, religion and education. So the children are safe in that regard because if parents do their part at home, inculcating their religious instruction and, and discipleship, spiritual discipleship all the government teacher has to do the government agent in that in that school all they have to do is teach them how to read and write and count and 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 everything the these these subjects that are really neutral subjects um and so what's the problem with me sending my kids to this this school because I'm going to be on it. I'm going to be watching everything they're learning. And I'm going to, as a parent, teach them about our values, the values from, from our home. And so I'm not really worried about what they're going to get from the school because it's, it's supposed to be neutral. And we will see to it. And if, if, if they bring in some of that critical race theory and things, we're going to go and fight at, at, at the... Um, school board meeting and see to it that that is removed from the school. Very common argument. Um, first of all, not only are the government schools not neutral, and I think you live under the greatest delusion if you think that they do teach from a posture of neutrality, they do not. But I would go farther and say they cannot be religiously neutral that it is impossible categorically for any school to not take sides. And they, they don't stay neutral. Like even on the issue of origins, you're teaching a child somewhere between 10,000 and 14,000 hours between kindergarten and 12th grade that the cosmos evolved without divine intervention, that, that you are at the very least ignoring the creator God in your instruction. And what did Paul tell Timothy? He said, remember your creator. Uh, you know, and so we're supposed to, uh, you know, re remember those things that we were taught uh, from a young age and so uh, about the creator. And so we, we have this instruction that we're supposed to um, teach our children about where everything came from. And I have some quotes in my education book from Dr. R.C. Sproul and Dr. Gordon Clark, where Dr. Gordon Clark says the public schools are not neutral, nor were they ever 
have they ever been or can they be? Um, he says, Let, let's consider for a moment a school that says, oh God, we neither assert nor deny your existence. And oh God, we neither obey nor disobey your commands. We're strictly neutral. Yeah. Is that really a posture of neutrality? He says, no, that's, that's hostility. To act as though God does not exist or that he's irrelevant um, is not something God is, is okay with. You know, I, I think if we stand before God on judgment day, it won't work for us to say, well, God, you can't eternally punish me. I didn't hate you. I just ignored you. Yeah. And Jesus said, if you're not for me, you're against me. Jesus didn't give us a posture of neutrality. And so R.C. Sproul said that, you know, if, if God exists, the one thing he can never be is irrelevant to anything. He can never yeah. be irrelevant to his creation. He can never be irrelevant to these academic subjects that he's created. And that's what the schools are doing. They're either hostile against Christ, against God, or they're saying, we just don't talk about him here. And yet we're told in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 that we're supposed to trust in the Lord with all of our heart to lean not on our own understanding, but in all of our ways, acknowledge him. Yes. I think that means we have to acknowledge him even in our academic ways. And then it says, don't be wise in your own eyes. And so, um, you know, Jesus said that if you will not acknowledge me before men, I will not acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. The scripture teaches that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Uh, how can you teach your children knowledge, wisdom, and understanding when you don't begin with the foundation of the fear of the Lord? You know, uh, the Apostle Peter says that we're supposed to add to our faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. He doesn't say start teaching them random facts. He doesn't say start teaching them knowledge. He says you start with faith and then you add virtue yeah. and moral character and then you add knowledge. So there's two layers, foundational layers before you get to knowledge. And why does he say that? Because in Hebrews 11:6 he says without faith it is impossible to please God. Do the government schools begin with the foundation of faith in God? No, they don't. So can they please God? Hebrews 11:6 says it's impossible for them to please God. Why? And then it answers the question because whoever comes to God has to acknowledge that God is and he rewards those who diligently seek him. Yeah. Government schools do not do that. They do not acknowledge God. They do not recognize him. They do not acknowledge that he exists. And they don't tell students that, that they will be rewarded by the knowledge of God when they seek him and study him. And we're also told in the scripture that whatever is not of faith is sin. And so when these government schools do not begin with faith in God as the foundation for all sound knowledge and learning, uh, which was the the statement, uh, there, if you go back and look at 1636, Harvard College's original mission statement, uh, it says that the, the foundation of learning, I can't quote exactly, but it's, it's to lay Christ in the bottom as the foundation for all sound knowledge and learning. And yeah. so uh, they're not doing that. They're not beginning with the fear of the Lord. They're not beginning with that foundation of, of knowing God. You know, I think again of John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. That's the foundation. We have to start with knowing God, knowing Jesus, that he's the creator, that he made everything. And now we're going to study these academic disciplines that he's made, and we will be rewarded by knowing him better and being more equipped to love and serve other people through these studies. So you have two different kinds of education. You have humanism, which puts man at the center of all things, uh, that makes man really the, um, uh, the central focus. The education is all about me. It's about my, my having a degree so that I can get employment, so I can make a lot of money, so I can have a successful career, so I can be comfortable, so I can be affluent. Like it's all focused on me and my personal achievement and my personal success. That's humanism, right? Biblical Christianity would say that the purpose of an education is to know God first and foremost, and then to be equipped to love and serve other people with the skills that we learn uh, through the things that we study. They're just two completely different, completely opposite uh, foundations, motives, approaches, uh, methodologies. It's completely different. The one is antagonistic to the biblical model. The government school system is antagonistic to the biblical model. And, and then that issue of, of we're going to go to the, the school board meetings and the PTA meetings, and we're going to, we're going to, you know, try to convince them of our way. And, and we're going to make the public schools, the government schools more conservative, right? Yeah. Two things. We've been doing that for a hundred years. Are the government schools today better because of conservatives and, and religious people going to PTA meetings and trying to join the school board? No. no, far worse now than they were even 40 years ago. 
Um, we're not winning, we're losing, right? So things are not getting better, they're getting worse. And I always use the illustration that I think Dietrich Bonhoeffer used where he said, if you are on a train and your intention is to go north, but you find that inadvertently you got on a train that's going south, the way to go north is not to run as fast as you know how in a northerly direction on the southbound train, because that will never get you north. That's what going to PTA meetings and joining the school board are. It's yeah. running as fast as you can in a northerly direction on a southbound train. And the government schools were a train that was designed to go south from day one. That's their intended yeah. destination. Christians don't know this. Christians who work in the government school system think that they're going north or that they can get north, but it is a train going south. And if you want to go north, you have to get off the train that's going south. You have to find a train that's going north, get on that train and go north. But it's a completely different paradigm. It's a completely different methodology. It's a different philosophy. It's a different approach. And people aren't willing to do that because they have so much invested in it. And then they make a living doing it. Public school system in America is the number one employer in the United States. Yeah. And so people are financially invested in it. And their, their mother was a teacher and their aunt was a teacher and their grandmother was a teacher. And so when I talk about these things, they get personally offended. And they're like, so you're saying that my grandmother was a bad person. Or you're saying that Mrs. Johnson at our church who teaches in the public school, she's, she's a bad person. No, I'm not saying that. I think she's well-intentioned. I think she means well. And I think she's running as fast as she knows how in a northerly direction on a southbound train. But I think the evidence is in. We have 100 years of this experiment. It didn't, you know, it, it didn't work for the, the things that we thought it was to accomplish. You know, yeah. Christians thought the public school system was to teach their kids how to read, write, and do arithmetic. It didn't work for that. It's been a complete failure for that. But it's been wildly successful for the purpose for which it was created, which was to destroy the family, to destroy Christianity in America, and to break the allegiance of children from their parents, and to basically introduce a Marxist uh, ideology into the United States uh, you know, uh, consciousness. So yeah. wildly successful. And th that was really the primary goals and intentions of the founders of the government school system. And again, you need to read Alex Newman's new book on the history of the government school system. But um, the, the government schools are not broken. They are not failed. They are accomplishing beyond the wildest dreams of the founders, the goals and intentions of the founders. Yeah. Yes, that's that's uh, that's another book that um, I highly recommend here um uh, uh indoctrinating our children to death i think is the title um alex newman um yeah i understand what you're saying but mathematics all it is is just numbers how can it possibly go either way that that seems that that's that's a, a by design a, just a neutral it's just numbers how, what 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 opinion could God possibly have when it comes to mathematics? You know, John, I love how you've heard all these arguments. Yeah, uh, these are all the classic arguments. You've com you're compressing them all into one interview <laughs> space. I love it. Um, okay, so let's think about this uh, for for a minute. Suppose that you have a math class, and the teacher says, "Okay, class, here's the problem that's on the board: two plus two. What is two plus two?" And a little seven-year-old boy raises his hand. We'll call him Johnny. And the teacher says, yes, Johnny, what's the answer? And he says, four. She says, great, very good. You did great. Answer's four. Well done. And he keeps his hand up. And she says, uh, yeah. And he says, I have a question. She says, yes. And he says, why? She says, what do you mean? Well, why? Why is two plus two four? Yeah, who says? <laughs> she says, what, what, what do you mean? Like, it just is. He's like, well, yeah. like, is it always four? She's like, yes, it's always four. He's like, well, couldn't it be like five on Tuesday and like 13 on Friday and 88 on my birthday? She's like, no, it doesn't work that way. Well, why, why doesn't it work that way? Now, here's the thing. By law in our country, she's not allowed to answer Johnny's question correctly. Yeah. If she does, she'll get fired by law. So she can't give the true correct answer. So she's limited to a couple answers. The one is she can just say, well, Johnny, it just is. We don't know why. That's just how it works. I don't find that to be a very satisfactory answer. But if she were to take the, the big story, uh, the overstory, the, as, as philosophers call it, the meta narrative of, of 14,000 hours of government school indoctrination and compress it into a tiny little space, 
what she might tell him is, okay, here's why mathematics works. Everything that exists in the entire universe came about from an explosion that happened 14 billion years ago. There were dust and gases that, uh, that, that originally, well, originally all the, the matter and energy of the, in the universe was compressed into a tiny little speck about the size of a period on a page in your textbook. And one day for no reason at all, it exploded. And as it exploded, um, it expanded. And as it expanded, it began to cool down and the, the building blocks of biological life began to form. And so you had amino acids and proteins and simple celled organisms. And then they began to uh, divide and, and to replicate. And you started to develop more complex um, biological structures. And so basically, eventually those simple celled organisms became highly complex structures like your DNA helix, uh, your human brain, your eye, et cetera. And everything that's ever existed in the universe in the physical world or what we call the metaphysical world, the world of things we can't see, the world of ideas, uh, all of that is the result of a big bang that happened 14 billion years ago for no reason. So your desk, your, your body, like everything material and physical, that's all the result of a cosmic big bang. Things like mathematics, music theory, logic, um, physics, thermodynamics, all of those things also exist because of the big bang. And that's the that's the major overstory of the government school that they pound into children over and over and over and over the yeah. origin story right so everything that exists came about that way well that's a that's a narrative that's a, a truth claim but there's a competing truth claim and that is in colossians chapter one it says that through christ the lord jesus christ god yeah. made the worlds the visible things and the invisible things well the visible things are the material world and the invisible things are the the invisible you know the metaphysical world it says, through Christ, God made the worlds, and they're made for him, they're made by him, they're through him, yeah, yeah. And, and through his power, he holds them together. Yeah. The reason that mathematics works, Johnny, <laughs> I could tell him, is because the Lord Jesus Christ created mathematics to reflect his mind. We didn't make mathematics. No human invented mathematics. We discovered yeah. mathematics. It was built into the universe. We didn't discover music theory. We didn't, I'm sorry, we, we didn't create music. Uh, we discovered music. Music was already a part of the fabric of the universe. We just learned how to systematize it, write it down and, and formulate it so that we could harness it and use it. The yeah. same thing with the laws of motion, the laws of, of physics um, and logic. We didn't create logic. We just discovered logic and we wrote it down and systematized it. And so I could tell Johnny the reason that all these things work, the reason that mathematics is consistent and predictable is because God says, I am the Lord and I do not change. There's a consistency, there's a constancy, uh, an immutability, theologians call it, an unchangeableness of God's nature. And that's why mathematics works. And I sometimes tell uh, people, you know, when I was a homeschool boy, I loved getting those science kits where you could do science experiments in your own backyard. And I, I never followed the directions. Uh, cause that's just my personality type. And so as a result, I blew up a lot of things in my backyard <laughs> and of all the things that I blew up in my backyard, nothing ever became more organized. Yeah. You know, it always became less organized. You went from something kind of intelligent, like a stereo to something that was just bits and pieces everywhere, but never did I have a bunch of bits and pieces that all formed a fully functioning stereo. Yeah. And yet a fully functioning stereo is far less complex than this human body. And so the government schools would want you to believe that originally there was nothing, there was non-matter, and then all of a sudden there was matter. And they would want you to believe that there was then matter, non-biological matter, that yeah. suddenly formed biological life. And then that somehow this simple-celled biological life became highly complex structures. And then somewhere down the road, that hum human lump of cells developed consciousness and awareness yeah. that the clump of cells started to think about itself and became self-aware and self-conscious and began to ask questions about its own existence and its own meaning and to start started to to discover language and again mathematics and science and all of these things so so you have two completing competing truth claims one of the, uh, they can't both be true and yeah. so if, if the government school narrative is the true one, that everything created itself by accident through chaos and time plus matter plus chance, well, we have a responsibility to teach that to our children. 
But if that's false, and if that's not true, why would you send your child to 14,000 hours of indoctrination in something that you know is a lie? When the scripture says the Lord detests lying lips, they are an abomination to him, but he delights in them that speak truly. Why would we send our children to a school that is lying to them when God says that's an abomination? He uses that phrase. Lying lips are an abomination to him. So yeah. when we know they're lying to our children, we send them anyway. Um, that's not something God is neutral about. He calls that an abomination. Yeah. Um, so as we begin to land the, this plan here, um, can you talk about um, discipleship? Um, is education, formal education, uh, a part of or apart from uh, the, the concept, a biblical concept of discipleship? Jesus said when a student is fully trained, he will become like his teacher. Yeah. Now, I believe this is one of the reasons why we're told um, in the scripture that we're not supposed to be yoked together with those who are unbelievers. Yeah. Um, some translations put it, don't partner together with those who are unbelievers. And I've had pastors tell me, oh, well, that's only talking about don't marry somebody who's not a Christian. Well, the passage doesn't say anything about marriage. You know, it's the only place evangelical Christian pastors are willing to apply that particular text is to marriage. But it just says don't partner with unbelievers. Now, it doesn't mean we can't be you know, nice to non-Christians. It doesn't mean we can't, uh, you know, serve them when they come into our restaurant. You know, it doesn't mean, because Paul says we have to leave the world, you know, if we don't yeah. interact with non-Christians. But he's talking about intimate partnership. And when you partner with your child for 10 to 14,000 hours and you you delegate that to in partnership to another person and say, I'm contracting with you for the education of my child. And I'm entrusting you. That you are going to educate my child. Uh, that's a tremendous amount of trust. And to do that with someone who doesn't share your faith, um, how can two walk together unless they agree? You're, you're yoked together in this and you're not going in the same direction. You don't have the same goals. You don't have the same value system. You don't have the same agenda. And so uh, is it discipleship? Yes. Over time, the principle is that the student becomes like his teacher. And so do you want your child to become like the people that they hang around? Well, they will. I think about 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 33, where it says, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good character. Yeah. And then in Proverbs 13, 20, it says, if you walk with wise people, you will become wise, but a companion of fools will be destroyed. So I think about that as a father and I think, okay, I don't want my child to be destroyed. How can I keep my child from being destroyed? Well, apparently I have to keep him away from fools. So how do I know what a fool looks like? Well, the Bible gives me a couple of definitions. One is where it says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Yeah. So I need to keep my child away from teachers who say that God does not exist or God is irrelevant. Because that person is a fool. And I want my child to be destroyed. So I need to keep my child away from that person. And the other definition the Bible gives us of a fool is in Proverbs 22, 15, where it says foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Mm. So what's interesting is evangelical Christian parents think to themselves, I want my child to be wise. And I want my child to be well-rounded and well-socialized. So I think what I need to do is I need to put them in a classroom with a teacher who says that God doesn't exist or God is irrelevant to everything we talk about here in class. So we don't need to talk about him here. Uh, which the Bible calls a fool, and then take this child who has foolishness bound up in their heart, put them in a class with 30 to 40 other children who also have foolishness bound up in their heart, and this will be a wonderful recipe for wisdom and good socialization. It's ridiculous. So the scripture says we're supposed to avoid the, the counsel of the ungodly, right? In Psalm yeah. chapter one, we're not supposed to let them be in the way of sinners. What's that? The social environment. Um, but instead, their delight is supposed to be on the law of the Lord. And on that law, they're supposed to meditate day and night. How can they meditate on the law of the Lord day and night when they're in a school where the law of the Lord is not even allowed? There's just so many principles that we violate when we put our children into these anti-Christian government schools. And, and we totally ignore the things we're commanded to do. So, so instead of having them be with companion of fools, it says, if you want to become wise, let them hang out with wise people. Well, what do wise people look like? Well, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So you want your children. And, and I also think wisdom tends to be something we find more in older people, the aged, the elderly, those that have some yeah. life experience, not youth. And so rather than having your children hang out with a peer group of children their own age, you should be thinking, 
Who are some godly older people who have the fear of the Lord that could mentor my children and that could be a good influence in my children? Let them spend time around those people because they'll become like that. We become like the people that we hang around. So it's not just the content that's being taught in the textbooks, although that's important. It's the structure, it's the form of the and methodology of the classroom and how they're teaching children that's important. And then it's the social environment that's important. Um, we, we need the content and the practice, the, the form of the teaching to be exclusively, explicitly biblical in every way. Amen. Um, in your book, you also talk about the role of the church. Um, so can you talk about um uh what what should be uh the uh church involvement on on a broad uh scale uh because and and, and I know I'm, I'm saying on the broad scale it's it I know it's boils down to the local church um but I do know that some of the things that we do it's within a kind of a subculture Christian subculture um and the reason I'm asking, uh, the reason I'm interested to hear what what uh, some more on this is, I do know that the uh, Protestant clergy of back in the day uh, decided to step aside and allow for parents to, well, I mean, decided to give in to the government basically. Uh, for fear of Catholics, as as Catholics were immigrating here, uh, they thought that Catholics would would take over and change the system from a Protestant system to to a um, Catholic system, uh, and and Catholics obviously ended up creating their own schools because they were rejected by the the public school of the time, a Protestant, predominantly Protestant, in my understanding. What, what, Whatever part I'm wrong, just no, you're right just, on. just let no, me know. Right on, that's all true. Um, yeah. So now that we're here, we're here. Eighty-five mm -hmm. percent of kids are in the in the system, um, and the system is the biggest employer. It's taking all this money. Uh, what 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 is the role of the church now? How do we respond? How do we? Um, what do you say to pastors, for example? What is your message? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say several things. First of all, you need to tell people in your church that the house is on fire and it's time to get our kids out of the government school system. Yeah. So that's number one. Uh, these children need a Christian education. Secondly, rather than trying to replace the parents and do their job for them, teach and equip the parents to do their own job. Disciple yeah. them and teach them how to disciple their children. There is, I think, a place uh, for the church as, as a bit of a safety net for the rare situations where you have um, someone whose spouse dies. Uh, for example, I have a friend who has nine children. He and his wife were homeschooling. His wife got cancer and his wife died fairly recently. So he has nine children and he has to work. He has to provide for them. Very difficult for people to be able to support nine children uh, with a work at home kind of situation. And so um, thankfully, he's been able to put them in a private Christian school. Sadly, most private Christian schools are not truly biblical. Uh, they don't yeah. have a biblical worldview. They're very humanistic. They um, try to mirror the government school system as much as they can. Yeah. Uh, many of them, um, I mean, you interviewed Jay Jacino. Many of them are teaching the same kinds of woke ideologies as the government schools. Yeah. But, you know, for, for children who are orphaned, for children who are in just unique situations where uh, a family really needs help, or, or even for uh, situations where you have someone who maybe isn't even a, a Christian, but that they, um, they need a safe place for their child. Uh, a church can have an outreach maybe to the community. Like I'll give you one example. Years ago, a friend of mine was a pastor in Detroit, Michigan. And there were lots of people who um, were low income families, but also a lot of immigrants. And so some of these uh, first generation American immigrants, they didn't speak English very well. And so they're thinking, I don't want my child to go to the Detroit public schools because they're not safe and they have horrible academics. Yeah. So I want my child to have a better education. And so what can I do with them? And I don't speak English very well. So how can I teach my child how to read and all this when I don't really read English myself and I barely speak it? So he started a Christian daycare at a Christian K through 12 school. 
and he would not allow people who are members of his church to send their children there. He told them, if you are a Christian family, you need to teach your own children. I'm not going to do your job for you. You need to teach your children. You disciple yeah. your children. And he started a, a homeschool umbrella program, a homeschool program under, under his church, under his Christian school. So he would teach you how to homeschool uh, through his Christian school. But he said, if you're a member of my church, you can't send your children here to the daycare or the Christian school. You need to teach your own children. But then these people from the community, they would bring their children to the daycare. And his view was they're going to send their children to some daycare somewhere. If they send them across town, that child might be sexually abused in that other daycare. Yeah. Here, they will be safe. Here, they will be protected. And here, we will teach them about Jesus from the time they're very young. And he would tell these parents, even Muslims, he would say, I want you to be very clear about our goal. Our goal is we want to teach your children about Jesus and we want to convert them to becoming Christians. And we want to convert you to become a Christian. And so we're going to teach your children the Bible and we're going to teach them about Jesus. If you're not okay with that, you can go somewhere else. But if you send your child here to our Christian school or in our daycare, this is what we do. We teach them about Jesus. And these Muslim parents would say, okay. And they would sign the paper to yeah. have their children there because they knew their children would be safe and then they get a good quality academic education. And so the whole time, whenever they would come, he would tell them about Jesus. He would do evangelism. And some of them got saved and they got baptized. And then he mm -hmm. would say, okay, now we're going to start teaching you how to teach your own children. But these families that were coming from the community, uh, he would tell them, it's not our job to teach your children. It's not our job to raise your children. It's your job to raise your children. And so his job was always in his mind to work himself out of a job. Yes. Not to just have a career raising other people's children, but to say, we want to be a safe place for these children who are going to be put in a worse environment. But we want to teach them the Bible. We want to teach them about Jesus. So like those are cases where I think, you know, people ask me, what do you think about Christian schools? I, I think there can be a place for Christian schools. They're not explicitly condemned in the scripture. I, I believe government schools are. Uh, you have to read my book to, to see that. <laughs> but but I don't yeah. think Christian schools are are condemned in the scripture. But for me, as a Christian father, to just send my children away from me for 14,000 hours, even if I'm sending them away to a Christian school, yeah. I don't think I'm obeying Deuteronomy 6. You know, that passage in Deuteronomy 6 says, I'm supposed to teach my children when I wake up in the morning to when I go to bed at night. And it says, whether you sit inside your house or you walk outside your house. And I always think, how universal is that? Like, is there ever a time when I'm, I'm either not inside my house or outside my house? Like, I'm always one or the other, right? So, so yeah. God says, if you're inside your house, teach your children. If you're outside your house, teach your children. From the time you wake up in the morning, the time you go to bed at night, teach your children. How can I do that when my children aren't with me? And the average Christian parent today, the mom spends an hour a day with her children and dad spends 29 minutes. Oh, That's wow. That's the uh, Department of Labor Statistics, 2022 U.S. Department of Labor Statistics. How can we fulfill our mandate to disciple our children, like Deuteronomy 6 tells us, if we're sending them away from us, even even if it's to other good Christians, we're, we're disobeying the things we're commanded to do. And so, yeah, I think that there's there's places where the church should be serving, but I feel like we're going to have to find a way to make Christian schools far more affordable than they are, because before COVID, it was ninety six hundred dollars per year per child. We're now at like twelve thousand dollars per year per child yeah. for average national average for private school. Who can afford that? You have three children, that's $36,000. Who can afford that? So we're going to have to find a way to make it more affordable because Christian schools should be there for those who are in desperate need. And, and we've instead made them for elite, wealthy Christian families. They're the only ones that can really afford most Christian schools. Yeah. I don't think that's, I don't think Jesus is okay with that. So I think there's, there's a place for Christian schools but we really need to rethink how we've approached that and make it much more accessible for those who are uh, in financial need. And churches can help by creating a fund for Christian education. I know some churches who won't give any money to foreign missions until they have fully funded every child in their church to get a Christian education. Because Jesus said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. So you think about these concentric circles moving outward. You start local start Jerusalem. So if we're not yeah. discipling our own kids, if we're losing 70% of our own children to the world, which is the national average for evangelical churches that we lose 70%, mm. if we're losing 70% of our own young people, but we're trying to, you know, send missionaries overseas to evangelize people in other countries, that's misplaced. 
So I'm all for, for reaching the outer rings. We need more missionaries, not less. We need more work internationally, not less. But we're ignoring our own children and focusing on foreign missions. Yeah. So well, we need to focus first and foremost on, are we discipling our own children and then work our way out to, to a more global vision? Yes. But if we can send our kids to the government school that is is free, Free. Um, <laughs> Free. That we as a church don't have to pay anything to, <laughs> for the kids in our church to go there. Uh, all we have to do is support the school and, and pray for the kids and uh, be somehow involved in, in other ways. Um, you know, send the Bible to school program from our church and all this. Then we'll, we will be uh, left with with good money to send to our long-term missionaries over there in, in um, China. Well, it's so ironic that we say that about government schools. Government schools are the most expensive. So as I said, we're about $12,000 per student for uh, private schools. Government schools are national average about $14,000 per year per child now. Homeschooling yeah. is only about $800 per year per child. Yeah. I mean, so government schools are the most expensive of any of the educational models. They are the most expensive. And people say, well, you know, it's free to me. Okay, well, is it? Um, the government doesn't have any money. That's a very ec important economic principle. The government only has what it takes by force from some people to redistribute to other people. Part of the reason why people can barely afford to buy groceries is because um, we're supporting the monstrosity of the government school system. We yeah. pay for that in our taxes. Um, most people, they'll say, well, I pay my taxes. I ought to get some kind of benefit out of it. I don't know most people that are paying like $14,000 in property tax. If you're paying $14,000 for the school portion of your property tax, you have a nice house. <laughs> you could probably afford private school. <laughs> that's only one child. What that's about the other child. three? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, so no, they're not free. They're not, uh, they're not affordable. And, and the reason that we're facing this inflation um, is largely because we're funding those kinds of programs and we pay for it. it. You know, you have to understand macroeconomics to know how it works, but you pay for it when you buy milk and bread uh, and eggs at the grocery store. And when you put gas in your car, you are paying for that socialized uh, system. And so, you know, people I say, well, we need to try to make the government schools more conservative. And my viewpoint is, okay, so let's say that we even achieve that, which we wouldn't. We've been trying that for a hundred years. It hasn't worked. We, you know, that's not going to work. But let's say we did. What you end up with at the end of the day is a slightly more conservative government school. <laughs> you know, yeah. to me, the problem is not conservative Marxism versus liberal Marxism. The problem is the Marxism. Yeah. And we need to get Christians to think differently. You know, Christians always say, "Oh, I'm anti-socialist. I'm anti-Marxist," but then they want all the Marxist <laughs> social programs. Yes. And so I always say that Christians are only opposed to the Marxism from which they don't personally feel like they benefit. Yeah, I mean, your average uh, Christian and, and conservative, uh, they might be anti-welfare. They might even be priding themselves to not be on any kind of government uh, handouts, yeah. um, but then demand that the government provide other education of their children are uh, using the, uh, over here, I mean, um, Wrightsville, Pennsylvania, which is um, uh, somewhat conservative, uh, small town. Uh, we pay, I think uh, we pay here about uh, 2,900 in, in property taxes. Uh, so yes, we should be able to educate all three and more of our children off of that, uh, yes. Okay. The math all doesn't right. work, does it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, all right. So we have had a very enlightening um, conversation here, sir. Uh, again, I am so thankful. Uh, just to remind everyone, uh, Counter Revolution Podcast is dedicated to exploring the meaning of education, a Christian philosophy of education, and why every Christian should have an explicitly and unapologetically uh, Christian philosophy of education. I believe, mm. sir, 
that if you have a Christian philosophy of education, you cannot send your children to government school uh, because the government school is anti-Christian. It's just decidedly anti-Christian. Uh, they tell you at the door. And so, again, like you said earlier, uh, you make it clear in your book that uh, Christ himself said, if you're not gathering with me, you're scattering. If you're not with me, you're against me. Uh, the public school is against Christ. They have to. They have no choice. It's a government school. They want separation of church and state. Their interpretation of that is the church has nothing to do with the state. The state has nothing to do with the church. Now, they don't live up to that. They're, they're not consistent. But they will make sure that the church says nothing, uh, that the Christian takes off their Christian hat before they walk into the building. And so I don't think you can be, you can have a consistent uh, philosophy of education and, um, and, and send your children to government school. So to close out here, sir, finally, <laughs> uh, can you, any last thoughts that you would like to add? Uh, maybe something that people can hold on to as we, we proceed here in this, in this fight. I'm actually thinking of a quote from an unexpected source. People probably wouldn't expect this quote to come from me, but it's a quote from Malcolm X. Yes. And Malcolm X said, only a fool allows his enemies to educate his children. And we're doing that as a Christian community. And we are surprised when our children are becoming atheists and when they're walking away from the faith. And when you allow an atheistic, godless government school system to have you, your child and essentially raise your child, uh, and they're being raised really between the schools and screens, right? Yeah. You know, it's 25, 30,000 hours of input between classroom time and screen time. Um, you have to remember that social media stuff is not your friend either. Uh, Hollywood, the music industry, the gaming industry, those things are designed to destroy your child's soul. They are not neutral. They are hostile to Christianity. And so we as Christian parents need to be vigilant and we need to buy back time. Uh, again, that, that book that I, I was telling you about, the uh, Raising Them Up, Parenting for Christians, yeah. I talk in there about influence. If you want to have influence in your child's life, you have to spend more time with your child than anybody else in their life. If Whoever spends the most time with your child and affirms your child the most wins. Whoever spends the most time with your child and affirms them the most will have the most influence. And so if you want to have the most influence in your child's life, you need to spend more hours. I'm not talking about just quality time. You need to spend more time with your child than anyone else. And you need to make that time count. You need to be very intentional about building into your child uh, and, and keeping the bad stuff out, but putting the good stuff in. Um, that's our mandate as Christian parents. And um, not only are we commanded to do it, we can do it. We can do it. It is achievable. It is doable. Um, will it cost us something? Yes. Will it inconvenience us? Will we have less free time? Yes. But it's worth it because these are eternal souls that we have been entrusted with. And uh, I don't know of any parent who at the end of their life ever said, oh, I wish I just would have worked more and spent less time with my children. Nobody ever says that. Yeah. Um, they regret the time that they did not invest, but they never regret the time they did. And so we have a great opportunity. It's this little window of time. It's a little window of influence. We need to be faithful with what we do with that time. Yeah. Uh, George Barner uh, recently in his, I think, I, I believe he's been saying it for a while now, but said it again in his recent book uh, that, uh, a worldview is pretty much solidified by the time someone is uh, 12 to 13 years old. Um, and whoever is speaking into your child the most in that period of time, that's whose worldview is going to uh, uh, influence that child the most. Uh, not to say that people can get saved and, and, um, get be renewed as according to Romans 12 uh but it, it's much harder to to change someone's overall world view um when they're already an adult it's like bending a tree 
you have to start bending it when it's much younger because that's when it's malleable. It can be bent one or another. Once it's strong and deeply rooted, it's it's to, uh, to, in in some ways actually the tree itself is impossible to even bend. You have to cut it anyway. Um, so um, how uh, uh, can people find you? What what are the things? I know you already talked about some books, but uh, what else are you doing out there? And how can people find you? Okay, there's several ways. Um, I'm on Facebook. I spend a lot of time on there. So uh, look me up on Facebook as Israel Wayne, uh, also Family Renewal. Uh, we have a website. It's familyrenewal.org, familyrenewal.org. My name, israelwayne.com, is a site to go to if you're interested in having me speak in your area. Um, and then I have a website on Christian apologetics called christianworldview.net. Uh, those are all great places um, to, to connect. Um, if you go to familyrenewal.org, we have a tab there, forward slash store, uh, a tab there. You go to our store. You can buy my books on there. If you buy my books from my website, I'll sign them for you. I always figure that's something Amazon won't do. Yeah. Um, and then you can also sign up on our email list so we can let you know when we're going to be speaking in your area. I travel all over the United States and they do seminars. So we'd love to be able to let you know when we're speaking in, the, in your area. Um, we also have a podcast called Family Renewal that you can look up on YouTube. Or wherever yeah. you listen to audio podcasts, just look up Family Renewal Podcast. Um, we also have a Facebook group for parents uh, that's named after my book. It's called Raising Them Up, Parenting for Christians. And we have about 8,000 families in there, uh, parents uh, that, are, that discuss parenting topics. And um, so that's a, a good place to, to hang out if you're uh, a Christian. We, we invite you to come in there. Uh, so lots of different ways to connect. I am on most of the social media platforms in some form. I think I'm Family Renewal on Instagram. Uh, I'm on X. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, so we'd love to be able to connect with you wherever you hang out in social media land um, and uh, and just be able to continue to, um, you know, to, to stay connected with you. I, I have um, if you do ebooks and audiobooks, my ebooks and audiobooks are available at my publisher's website, masterbooks.com. Yeah. And so some people prefer those um, those things. I try to encourage people not to buy my books at Amazon. A lot of people don't know this, but like, you know, if you buy this book and let's say it's $12 uh, and you buy it on Amazon as an author, I only make like 85 cents. Yeah. And that's why Amazon owns the world because they just keep the profits. So if you order directly from our website, that helps me to fund what I do. Uh, yes. And so we appreciate when possible if you can order from our website instead of uh, supporting Amazon, um, they're, they'll be fine um, either way. <laughs> yeah. They're going to be okay. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. One, one, uh, one thing that uh, was recommended to me, and this is, I think, how I really came to uh, uh, look into your work. Uh, was with um, the Addisons, um, oh, Culture yeah. Proof. Uh, they oh, were talking yeah. about uh, foundational truths, uh, modern catechisms, uh, catechism answering uh, the essential questions um, of Christianity. Um, my, my daughter is still very small, but I've, I've started uh, to uh, introduce some of these things to her using this this uh, this document from from you from you guys so i'm, I'm thankful for it That's great. um that. yes so um we're gonna end here i want to thank you again sir um israel wayne thank you so much for agreeing to talk to me to join uh me here on this podcast um we are going to make this a two episode a part one and part two because we went on uh long but that's great. I I uh, I enjoyed our time together. I I am looking forward to having more of these talks. I, I like I said, I have a lot of questions. Some of them are personal, so I'll be reaching out uh, reaching out to you uh, again. But I had a great time. God had definitely has an opinion in education, and uh, you did a great job on this, sir. And so keep up the good work and. Um, Let's talk again soon. Well, thank you, John. I'm grateful for the work that you're doing. I think you're an important voice in this discussion. And I'm really thankful that God has opened your eyes on this topic and that you are helping others to um, think differently on these issues. And so 
I encourage you to, to keep um, moving in this direction. Uh, I expect that God is going to use your work very powerfully. So thank you, brother, for what you're doing. Thank you. That's very kind of you.